Good evening. I'm Matthew Santoraco, a professor of classics here at NYU and the director of our Center for Ancient Studies. As those of you know, who have participated in our many activities over the years, the center was founded 25 years ago within the Faculty of Arts and Science to promote the interdisciplinary and cross-cultural study of the past. We do this by encouraging faculty and students in a variety of arts and science departments and programs, as well as in other schools and institutes of the university to collaborate with one another through curriculum, research projects, occasional publications, and international study grants for undergraduate and graduate students. We also reach out to the larger scholarly community beyond NYU and to the general public. Thus, the Aquila Theater is company in residence at the center. In addition, we have sponsored through the Faculty Resource Network summer and winter seminars that bring together faculty from colleges and universities across the country to study aspects of the ancient world. Finally, we reach an even larger public through our annual conferences, many of which explore areas where ancient and modern experiences intersect and where the perspectives offered by the past can help us analyze and understand contemporary issues and challenges. We are certainly at a challenging moment right now. When the pandemic suddenly necessitated a pivot last spring to online work, the programming of our center was interrupted. We have resumed it this semester, but in a virtual format. Thus, we are hosting this year a series of webinars that are organized around the general rubric, Topics for Challenging Times, Ancient Perspectives on Modern Issues. We inaugurated the series last week with a conversation between a classicist, Joy Connolly, the president of the ACLS, and an American political scientist, Melissa Michelson, the Dean of Arts and Science at Menlo College, on the topic of elections, ancient and modern. This afternoon, we will focus on a different topic, monuments and memory, about which I'll say a bit more in a moment. Finally, on Thursday, December 3rd, we will have a panel discussion of what we are calling, for want of a better phrase, applied ancient studies. That is, how the field is reaching out to non-traditional or underserved communities, such as prisoners, indigenous peoples, veterans, and refugees. Next semester, we will continue this sort of online programming by hosting a symposium on pandemics, ancient and modern, that will focus on the bioarchaeology of pandemics, their historical and sociological implications, and the role of plague in the artistic imagination from Homer onwards. We will also inaugurate a webinar series on emerging scholars, where we will showcase research that is being conducted by current graduate students who seek to address new topics or use new methodologies. We also look forward to including in this series scholars from groups that have been or still are marginalized or underrepresented in the field of ancient studies and in the academy as a whole. If you're interested in attending any of these events, please check out the center's website. The website also contains an up-to-date calendar of all lectures, exhibitions, or conferences at NYU that are related to the ancient world. But now let's turn to our topic of this evening, monuments and memory. At a time when current events have revealed and exacerbated disturbing, dramatic inequalities in our society, when, for example, we are daily reminded of how a legacy of slavery and racism still informs our experience. It's not surprising that our history is being contested and that the monuments that commemorate it are themselves the object of dispute, being defended by some being defaced and even destroyed by others. 
In this context, it seems worthwhile to consider the role that monuments had in antiquity. Our goal today will be to provide useful historical context from the ancient world, specifically from Egypt, Greece, and Rome, about what and how we choose to remember and why and how we choose to forget. The format of today's panel, which should last for an hour and a half, will be as follows. Professor Hallie Franks will serve as our moderator, offering introductory remarks on the topic and introducing our three speakers. Each of our speakers will then make a brief presentation after which they will engage in dialogue with one another and also with all of us who are attending this event. To that end, you can submit questions that you would like to ask our speakers by using the Zoom webinars Q&A function, which appears at the bottom of your computer screen. I want to take this opportunity for thanking my colleague, Maura Pollard, our center's program administrator, who has set up this webinar and has worked tirelessly on all aspects of today's programming and indeed the year's programming. I also want to thank our distinguished panel of speakers and finally, all of you who have set aside time this evening to participate in this event. Now, let me start the proceedings by introducing our moderator. Professor Hallie Franks is Associate Professor at NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. She received her BA in Art History from Boston University and her PhD in the History of Art and Architecture from Harvard. Her research interests are in the art and archeology span of the ancient Mediterranean and Western Asia. And her teaching has focused on ancient visual culture, particularly on the intersections of images with constructions of power, gender, and cultural memory. Professor Franks has received numerous awards, including a visiting research fellowship at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World and a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. In addition to writing many articles, she is the author of Hunters and Heroes, Hunters, Heroes, Kings, a book that was published by the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, and another book, the World Underfoot, Mosaics and Movement in the Greek Symposium that was published recently by Oxford University Press. Her current research focuses on the influence of Greco-Roman sculpture in the construction of body aesthetics during the rise of physical fitness culture in the United States in the late 19th century. I'm now delighted to turn the podium, the virtual podium, over to Professor Hallie Franks. Thank you so much, Matthew. Hopefully I pop up here. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here Intr it, yeah, to introduce this great panel. I'm hoping that my picture will pop up. So it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and to introduce this, um, this panel. Before I do that, I just wanted to offer a few words of framing for this topic of monuments and memory. As Matthew said, the Center for Ancient Studies is interested in connecting the ancient to the current moment, um, or perhaps more precisely, it's interested in thinking through the perspectives that the ancient are and issues and questions with which we continue to grapple. For anyone in the US, this topic has obvious resonance with very pressing concerns about our systems of commemoration and whom and what those systems serve. In particular, our current moment has cast into sharp relief the ways in which monumental commemoration and honorifics have shaped, narrated, elevated, 
and represented certain histories in ways that profoundly impact those living right now. Monuments honoring the Confederacy and Christopher Columbus have been uh, the particular focus of public debate, but other honorific commemorations are also being rethought. Princeton University recently announced, for instance, that a new residential college named for Melody Hobson will replace one named for Woodrow Wilson. This is, and in fact has been, a worldwide phenomenon. It's not the case that these questions are exclusive to the contemporary US, but this is a moment, right? A moment that has laid bare and made undeniable the ways in which the violence and racism of our nation's past survive as systems of oppression wielded against black and indigenous men and women and children. Uh, this is a moment in which questions about monuments, memory and power are particularly crystallized here. One of the fears or concerns that has been articulated as part of this discourse is that the removal of statues or honorifics is a kind of erasure of history. Now I happen to be from a state uh, in which a very contentious Senate, Senate race is happening right now and the political ads are unavoidable. One side accuses the other of wanting to erase our history. That's a direct quote from a senatorial campaign ad airing right now. So this is a concept, this concept of erasing history is not my own, it's one that's in circulation and that has traction. And it's the concept of erasing history that I wanna focus on uh, for just a few moments here. As scholars and teachers and enthusiasts of ancient material culture, we are in fact well poised to intervene in thinking around this concern. What our panelists work shows are two related things. First, is that monuments represent history in a certain way. They, mark, uh, they make a mark on our landscape, they visualize, they make monumental, they claim permanence, they inscribe and enshrine. None of these things are neutral or objective acts. The second is that destruction too, in the many forms it takes, is also a mark of history and in history. The monument inscribes with its presence, its dominance, its elevation. Its removal too is an act, an inscription, a presence, even when it results in an absence. It's ironic actually, that when it comes to the study of the ancient world, these moments of rewriting, right? Of demolition, of replacement, of damage, of uh, to use a term of Professor Garner's, of visual cannibalism, right? These, these moments of rewriting, it's ironic um, that for us, these are moments of, of great excitement precisely because they tend to be moments where the narratives of power collide with reality. It's in these moments that we might actually glimpse history. It is not erased, but brought to life. So I hope that you, like I am, are very much looking forward to our panelists today. Uh, I'll introduce them each now. As questions come up, just to reiterate what Matthew said, please feel free to ask them in real time in the Q&A, and I'll get to as many of them as possible in the time that we have that follows our speakers. Our first speaker is Anne Roth, Clinical Associate Professor in the Departments of Hebrew and Judaic Studies and of Art History at NYU. Dr. Roth earned both her BA and her PhD at the University of Chicago. She's written articles on a huge range of topics, including birth metaphors in Egyptian mortuary rituals, the phenomenon of nesting in ancient Egyptian art, Afrocentrism and Egyptology, the omission of the spouse in mortuary monuments of all periods, and the references to landscape in the arrangement of decorative programs of old kingdom tombs. Since 1987, Professor Roth has carried out epigraphic and archeological work in the non-royal tombs in the Great Western Cemetery at Giza, about which she has published one book titled A Cemetery of Palace Attendants. She's working on a second. Her talk today is Inconvenient Monuments in Ancient Egypt, the Erasure of Female Pharaohs and Other Undesirables. Our second speaker is Patricia Yunji Kim, 
Assistant Professor and Faculty Fellow at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study here at NYU. Dr. Kim's research and teaching use art historical and archeological methods to explore questions of gender, power, and memory from the ancient world to the present. She's currently at work on a book titled Bodies of Power, The Art and Archeology span of Royal Women from the Hellenistic World, the fourth to the first centuries BCE. This is the first book length study on the visual and material culture of ancient queenship from the Middle East and the Mediterranean. She's also assistant curator and communications director at Monument Lab, which you can uh, find out more about at monumentlab.com. She received her doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. She'll talk today, uh, her talk today is titled Monumental Absences, Redacting the Statue of Queen Artemisia II at Rhodes. Our third speaker is Eric Varner, Associate Professor in the Art History Department at Emory University. He received his doctorate in classical archeology span from Yale University. Dr. Varner has written on Roman portrait sculpture, imperial iconography, Roman women, monuments, and the topography of ancient Rome. His publications include Mutilation and Transformation, Domnatio Memoriae and Roman Imperial Portraiture, and a second book called From Caligula to Constantine, Tyranny and Transformation in Imperial Roman Portraiture. He's currently working on a book, uh, which I am eagerly awaiting, titled uh, Grotesque Aesthetics, Transgression and Transcendence in the Age of Nero. Today, he'll speak on contested portraits and the monumental legacy of Rome's bad emperors. With that, from your virtual spaces, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Anne Roth. Anne? Hello. Thank you very much. I don't know why they're asking me to start my video. It's I'm going to be starting a PowerPoint. So if you will excuse me, I need to do that. Um, where is Zoom? OK, share screen. I can do that. Come on. Okay, you would not think that I do this every day, but I do. Um, hello, thank you very much, Hallie, for the introduction. Um, I was asked, as we all were, for this uh, evening to talk about the erasure and destruction of monuments, in my case, the monuments of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian case offers an embarrassment of choices. And so what I've decided to do is give you a very brief overview of those choices, and then to look a little bit more carefully at the case of the erasure of Queen's Regnant, which is an interesting single um, example. Now, the ancient Egyptians are rather expert at monuments. They're good at making big ones and monumental ones and impressive ones. Um, and they're also good at updating them, modifying them, uh, and even destroying them intentionally. Um, and obviously, Many of the kings were worried about that, and so they made their monuments fairly indestructible. The most common way in which monuments are attacked or damaged um, is what the classicists call damnatio memore. Um, and here you can see an example of that from a private tomb of the mid 18th dynasty. Um, the face of the tomb owner, as you can see, has been erased. And also above his head in the inscription, he is named twice, and his name is in both cases um, erased. Uh, his wife, her face is intact, but behind her head, you can see that her name has also been erased. Um, the thing by his knee is the bit larger hole is obviously just damage. Um, so this is intentional damage, and it is meant basically to destroy the chances of particularly the man for getting to the afterlife, which was a very big deal for the ancient Egyptians. Um, it re is basically a, we assume, a expression of personal animosity and uh, is a very horrible thing to do to someone. Uh, and it's oddly done quite frequently. 
Uh, let me show you an example of the second stage of this, where you erase someone's name and put your own in its place, uh, where you usurp a monument. This has been done um, in this monument, which is a lot earlier, um, twice actually. The tomb was first built um, for a man named Mary Teddy um, by his father, and then his older half-brother, Pepe Onk, usurped it and put his name where it had said Mary Teddy, and then Mary Teddy came along and put his name back. Presumably, he regained control of the tomb. Um, and as you can see on this false door, which was supposed to be painted red to look like granite, neither of them were very careful. They have erased the names and just left white limestone showing through the, the red paint um, that was supposed to make it all look like very fancy granite. In the same tomb, uh, changes were also made in the names and titles over roles of offering bearers. Um, here, the end of the caption, which I've outlined, originally named Mary Tetty, with Tetty's name in the cartouche or name ring, the royal name ring. Uh, his brother superimposed his own name, altering the cartouche to Pepe for his name, Pepe Ankh. When Mary Tetty took the tomb back, he left the name Pepe and converted it to a title, the name of Pepe's pyramid at which he held a mortuary priesthood. Um, so it now says Pepe meant Nefer, and then he ran his name uh, down the end of the row vertically. Um, this required the sacrifice, you can just see the foot at the left of his name, uh, which is at the bottom here. Um, you can just see the, the foot sticking out where he's, the guy has been erased. Um, this, however, was not terribly, uh, not a terribly great strategy in these particular rows because they ended with men carrying uh, very heavy chests on poles. And when you've obliterated the carrier, um, that it looks, the art looks sort of unstable because uh, it's heavy. So what they've done instead, as you can see in this, both this row and the one above it, the artist has lengthened the, the little legs of the carrying chests uh, so that you don't need the man at the end, although it makes it fairly hard to move. Some monuments, particularly those of kings, were simply updated. Um, currently visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm sorry about the sirens. I can't do anything about them. Um, at the Metropolitan Museum is a colossal statue of a Middle Kingdom king, which was later usurped by Ramses II. Given that there's a 650 year time difference between these two, it's probably uh, justifiable to conclude that this was not personal animosity, uh, but merely penny pinching on the part of Ramses II. Architecture was a, a popular place uh, to do this kind of updating. Um, and it was sometimes done without erasing the names and identity of the original builder. This is the uh, pylon of Thutmose the I at the fourth pylon at Karnak. And you can see that along the bottom, there are two horizontal lines of inscriptions. Um, there is the usurpation of inscriptions of monuments of this kind was so common that there was even a set formula that people used. They called it a renewal of monuments. So here we have two renewals of monuments, one over the top of another. Um, but just to show you the difference, the cartouche of the person in the upper row has been usurped by Pepe II only uh, a couple of years after it was first carved. Um, so this updating is important. Um, another kind of updating takes place when you have foreign kings. This is Taharqa, a 25th dynasty king. And the 25th dynasty kings had a uh, problem in that, well, not a problem, a difference from traditional Egyptian pharaohs in that they wore two uraeus cobra, uh, cobras on their foreheads. Um, and the Egyptians found this very weird. So when this foreign ruler was thrown out of Egypt, not by the Egyptians, actually by, by the Assyrians, um, the Egyptian kings who took over reclaimed their monuments. Uh, but as you can see here, they were they changed the names up here, but they were very bothered by the secret, second cobra. So you tend to find erased cobras. So when we can find an erased cobra, we can be fairly sure that the original owner of the monument was indeed a Nubian pharaoh. Still another kind of erasure that occurs uh, exclusively during the reign of the revolutionary pharaoh Akhenaten um, is the violent destructive campaign to erase images and names of the gods um, inspired by Akhenaten's new monotheistic religion. 
Uh, these gods and names were restored by later kings in most cases. Um, and uh, the deepest holes were filled with plaster. So thorough were Akhenaten's erasures, particularly of the chief god Amun, that Egyptologists who find intact images of that god prior to his reign are expected to defend, exp ex defend their dating and explain why Amun was not hacked out by Akhenaten because he was otherwise so thorough. Now, with that background of erasures and changes and usurpations and updatings, um, I'd like to discuss one particular kind of erasure, and that is a female pharaohs or queen's regnant. Of the many women who held political power in Egypt, um, most of them were mothers of kings. That was uncontested and it seems to have been absolutely generally accepted. And they tend to be honored after they uh, step down and allow their sons to take over. In a very few cases though, women ruled not as the king's mother, the acceptable manner, but as a close female relative, a stepmother perhaps, or an aunt, or even an older sister, uh, when a young man was unable to, was too young to rule for himself, but didn't have a, a good quality, a good character. Um, candidate as a mother to take over his rule. Um, in such cases, the women's authorities was limited. They didn't have the motherhood uh, role. And in many of these cases, they were then crowned king, taking on all of the accoutrements of male kingship. There have been a number of women identified as kings. I'm omitting, um, I'm going to be discussing only four of these. Um, the first one is a, a rather new one added to the list, Set Ibhor. Uh, Natakris is mentioned as a king at the end of the Sixth Dynasty only by uh, Greek sources, although people have argued that various Egyptian traces of sources may refer to a, a queen of this name. Other people have said it's actually a guy, and some people think she doesn't exist altogether. Uh, so I'm leaving her out. She obviously has no monuments. Um, then we get Sobek Nofru in the 12th dynasty, Hatshepsut in the early 18th dynasty. Nefertiti I'm also leaving out, not because she doesn't have monuments, but because she is married to the aforementioned religious revolutionary. And if her monuments are attacked, it's probably because of her religious beliefs and her, hus her association with her husband rather than her independent kingship. And the last um, queen regnant of Egypt, unless you count the Greek queens and, and uh, the, of the Ptolemaic dynasty, including Cleopatra II, is Tawasaret at the end of the 19th dynasty. Uh, I'm not counting Cleopatra, Cleopatra because that's confusing. You've got other non-Egyptian aspects to that kingship. Okay, and I'm going chronologically. Um, Queen Set Ibhor was actually the wife of a late fifth dynasty king uh, named Jedkare Zezi, and her pyramid complex, which is a part of his, is significantly larger than in both its pyramid and particularly its mortuary temple than those of other royal women of the Old Kingdom period of her period. It contains, in addition, many features found in the complexes of kings, including a room that may have been the chapel for five statues. It's in the right position and it's got the right proportions. Um, it has a cult pyramid and its own enclosure wall, which sometimes is shown on monuments of king's mothers. Uh, but it also has a causeway, which is very, very unusual. Not much of her mortuary temple remains. It's very, very badly battered, and there are loose blocks around, is what we interpret from. On these loose blocks, um, there are a number of changes, um, added kingly insignia that then are erased again. Um, and there are uh, a number of, of kingly things. If you see, it's very, very light, but you can perhaps see uh, on this loose block here, there is a falcon hovering over something. Since women of this era do not include their husbands in their tombs, uh, this falcon must be hovering over the queen herself. Um, so I would argue that she is one of these queen regnants. Um, Another example, another uh, characteristic of this is the fact that we do, did not know her name. Although this temple was excavated in the 1950s, uh, her name was only discovered last year. And you can see this fragment of a column here um, gives her name with a bunch of uh, queenly titles, not royal kingly titles, uh, which may have been why it survived. Her name is Set Ip Hor. The second queen who we know is really, really, really a king 
um, a, a female pharaoh, is Queen Sobek Nofru at the end of the 12th dynasty. Um, she takes on complete royal titles. She has the whole five-fold titulary of a king. Um, and she has similarly the problem that she's not very well attested. Her monuments tend to be in small pieces. Um, she has here, uh, is he, her name is given here. Uh, she's titled Daughter of the Sun God Ray. Um, may she live, feminine ending. She's not hiding her female nature. Um, over here on this cylinder seal impression, she's also called the female god Horus. The falcon has a little T after it, the feminine ending. Um, and again, daughter of Sakhmet, mistress of the two lands, she whom the beloved one of, of the sun god, and so forth. Um, she is very closely associated with um, the last king but one, uh, Amenemhet III. Amenemhet III is mentioned on this fragment of one of her monuments, um, and she does not mention at all the uh, Amenemhet IV, who may have been a younger brother or uh, younger stepson of some sort, but she obviously does not have the role of mother of the next king, um, so she is, is actually crowned king herself and ruled for a few years. Here you can see the only statue we have of her. As I said, her, her monuments tend to be very badly damaged. Uh, we know it's her because of the inscription on her belt buckle. Um, also, she is clearly female. You can see the breasts. Um, but she's dressed, I wanted to point out, exactly the way her grandfather, Senwasser III, is dressed with the Nimi's headdress lappets coming down, um, the damage amulet that she's wearing, that he is also wearing, um, a kilt with a triangular um, flat flap in front and a sporan uh, that you can see traces of on her. So she is wearing the standard kingly garb, but underneath it, you can see this horizontal line above the belt. That's the line of a woman's sheath. And you can also see the two straps going up and covering her breast in the conventional manner. The, the next queen I want to talk about is the one you will have heard of, possibly Queen Hatshepsut, who is shown here at a um, in a statue at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, she took the throne for over 20 years and ruled in tandem with her stepson and nephew, Thutmose the Third. Um, this reconstructed statue, as you can see, has been damaged. Uh, the head was broken off and the royal Uraeus cobra has been uh, cut off. That was not found and has not been restored. She was the builder in those 20 years of a number of monuments, restorer and builder of, of many monuments. This may actually religiously have been the most important. Um, it was a bark shrine um, at the temple of Karnak for the divine bark of the god, the chief bark um, of the god Amun-Re. Um, and it stood in front of the sanctuary, the most holy place of uh, the temple of Amun-Re at Karnak. Um, the bark shrine was completed by her co-regent, Thutmose III, after her death. Uh, but the same king apparently eventually dismantled it and replaced it with a bark shrine of his own late in his long reign. Its blocks were then used to fill a much later building, and it has now been reconstructed on the grounds of Karnak, where we can see it. On the walls of this bark shrine, uh, where Hatshepsut is represented along with Thutmose the III, she is shown as a young man, um, completely no feminine uh, attributes at all, except like Sobek Nofru in her names and titles, which are full of the feminine T ending. Her name actually means foremost of noble women. Uh, so it is very clear that she is not pretending to be a man. She is just having herself shown as a generic king who was 25 years old and male. Uh, this was also true of the images of her co-regent, that was the third, who may have been uh, 10 years old, but he's going to be shown as an adult male. And it's also true of other kings who may have been in their 50s or 60s, but are still shown as young athletic males. It's not, um, it's not an imposition. She's not trying to impose on the Egyptian people. She's just trying to show that she is a king. The images of her on this shrine have been partially erased, and Charles Nims pointed out years ago um, that they are erased by the block. In other words, for any given block, either all the images are not erased or they are erased. Um, and from this, he concluded that the blocks were erased after 
the shrine had been taken down. That is very late in the reign of Thutmose III. That implies in turn that Thutmose III did not erase her monuments after um, at the very moment that she died because he'd been furious for years that she was keeping off the throne, which was basically the assumption of an awful lot of the early 20th century uh, Egyptologists, that it was all his rage uh, to erase her. Nowadays, I think most Egyptologists believe that the problem is that she he was worried about his successor, his son, who actually had no genetic ties, no family ties, uh, except by marriage, to the earlier dynasty and um, that he erased the images of Hatshepsut because she was a reminder that there may have been other, uh, other alternatives of, from that early family that could take the throne uh, after his death. His erasures take a lot of different forms. This is um, a scene showing Hatshepsut. Uh, she's not completely erased as she was in the Red Chapel, uh, but she's been carefully chipped out. This wall was right next to the Bark Shrine um, and I think you can see it's been so carefully chipped out that you can actually read the hieroglyphic inscriptions up here with her name and titles. Um, and her silhouette obviously is completely visible. Also the silhouette tells us that she is again depicted as a man. Why he didn't just change the names here is a very interesting question. Uh, but that seems to be, uh, it, 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 it's varied whether this is, is done. Here you can see the central part of Karnak in a plan. Uh, this is where her bark shrine was. It's been replaced many times since. Uh, on either side of it were storerooms, and this was the wall that I just showed you. Um, it's covered with brown because that's the most of the third's construction. After erasing her image, he actually covered it up uh, with masonry of his own. Uh, and, and decorated that. He did the same, here you can see that wall, sorry. He did the same with her obelisks, uh, of which she was inordinately proud. Um, he just walled them up. You could not read the inscriptions on the bottom and I suppose the upper halves uh, without uh, binoculars, you couldn't read either, they were too high up. So here you see the base of one of her obelisk simply walled in. At Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Dar al-Bahri, she was also often very, very thoroughly erased, just like at the Chapelle Rouge, the, the Red Chapel, um, as you can see over here to the right. Here you have a figure of Amun, which has been later replaced. But there is one place in her temple, there are a number of places in her temple actually, but the most interesting of them is the very back of the temple. This is right next to the central sanctuary. And here she is shown making offerings to the god Amun, who's been erased and recarved, as you can obviously see. Um, but she is shown, interestingly, almost as a woman in a man's dress. You can see her breast, uh, and it's very clear if you compare her profile to that of Thutmose III on the, um, on the other image I have on this slide, uh, that she is shown as female. Her skin is also shown in a more female color. And he has not touched this, perhaps because out of, uh, he had respect for the image of Amun who was in this shrine. Obviously, Akhenaten did not have any respect for that image. Not only were the reliefs attacked um, in these, this temple, but it had a full program of statuary, <clears throat> which was taken out and broken into pieces and dumped in a quarry in front of her temple. And what you're seeing here is the 1928 excavations of the Metropolitan Museum, which dug those pieces up again. And as you can see from more excavation photographs here, you can see her hand just sitting there amidst all of the dirt. Uh, they were able to reconstruct many of these statues which now adorn uh, the Metropolitan Museum and the uh, Cairo Museum. Other strategies of, for dealing with this inconvenient uh, image of Hatshepsut uh, were taken in the little temple of Medina Tabu. The Hatshepsut rooms uh, were completely usurped. Um, Thutmose III was actually original here. He was put in uh, symmetrically with Hatshepsut and she is shown here uh, untouched really, except uh, in very late periods. These are probably early Christian hacking out of, of faces. Um, but the names have been changed to those of her husband. This temple had a bunch of weird replacements. 
Um, she was also hacked out here. You can just see the back of her head in this drawing and her arms coming up to pour this libation vesicle. She was replaced by a pile of offerings and a hieroglyph for life, which was given human hands so that it could hold on to the libation vessel. And my favorite of these, um, she was giving offerings to Amun and was shown over here, and she has been converted into a large lettuce plant. Um, lettuce was sacred to Amun because it was viewed as an aphrodisiac and he was a fertility god. Uh, so it's sort of odd. It's obviously associated with male fertility, um, but that's what they turned Hatshepsut into, perhaps sort of a vindication of her gender. I have just a few slides to show you of the remaining um, queen, Queen Tawasrit, is a, um, a queen in the 19th dynasty who became a king. She actually had a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, as did Hatshepsut, although it wasn't decorated, so I can't say anything about that. Um, but Tawasrit's tomb was fully decorated, and she was shown twice, for example, on this wall, um, being introduced to the god Osiris by two other gods, Anubis and Horus. Um, after her death, the throne was usurped by a man named Setnacht, who seems to have been di have died unexpectedly and usurped her tomb. She has been erased here and replaced not with a figure of the king, of the new king, but his name only. And throughout this tomb, um, they were obviously in a big hurry to get him in there, so they erased her and replaced him, uh, replaced her with his names. Interestingly, um, that means that toward the front of the tomb, where the plaster has fallen out. Um, of the, the cover replacing her, Tawasiris has actually uh, survived almost intact, uh, while strangely set knocked is um, remembered only by a few half finished drawings. Um, and so uh, there's a kind of um, rough justice here in that by erasing these people, um, we get uh, often preserved monuments. These monuments of Hatshepsut, this is a fragmentary head, now completely restored, but this is the fragmentary state um, of this head that was in that dump in front of Hatshepsut's temple, has resulted in the fact that the Met has some um, 30 or 40 statues of Hatshepsut in their collection, uh, probably more than any other king who is represented there. Um, so sometimes destroying monuments ultimately revolts in their survival. Thank you very much for your attention. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the next speaker, my colleague from NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study, Patricia Kim. Thank you so much, um, Anne. I feel like my presentation and your presentation um, have a lot in common. Let's see. There we go. View and your full screen. Okay, um, so thank you so much to I'm a, I'm unmuted, right? I think so. Okay, uh, thank you so much to Hallie and Matthew and Mora and everyone at the Center for Ancient Studies for organizing this program and for inviting me to take part in this conversation, um, which certainly reflects broader concerns around reckoning with existing monument landscapes and the ways that the symbols around us and spaces across America reflect and even prop up the country's systems of injustice, whiteness, and inequality. So in my talk, what I'd like to do is think seriously about confronting the symbols that tower over us alongside the symbols that might be missing. In other words, whose bodies are historically erased or hidden from public spaces, which communities and groups of people have been made unrepresentable, and what are the political and social implications of such absences? Central to identity formation, monuments are memory aids that create physical spaces for people to affirm specific narratives of what happened and who was there, but also, and perhaps most urgently, they express and contest power dynamics. Public art raises questions around whose stories are worth remembering, which values and ideas need to be memorized. Or to follow Haitian anthropologist Michelle Rove Trio, quote, any historical narrative is a particular bundle of silences, the result of a unique process and the operation required to deconstruct these silences will vary accordingly. 
These silences and absences speak loudly about which voices and bodies do and do not matter in political space. So for my talk, I'm turning to the Hecatomnids, a fourth century non-Greek dynasty that ruled Caria, a region in modern Southwest Turkey that was also a satrapy of the Achaemenid Empire. The dynasty was named after Hecatomnus, who with his wife Abba had five children that we know of. Now, a lot of these siblings married each other, Mausolus with Artemisia and Idrius with Ada. And although Caria was technically a part of the Persian Empire, by the reign of Mausolus and Artemisia, the Hecatomnids were powerful throughout the Eastern Mediterranean, exerting control over many cities and places, including places like Chios, Rhodes, and Kos. Now, besides the sibling blood marriages, another unique aspect of the Hecatomnid dynasty was that after Mausolus died, our historical sources tell us that Artemisia came to rule on her own. So she was a queen regent. We learn from the first century architect Vitruvius um, about what ensued after Mausolus' death and Artemisia's rise in De Architectura. He tells us about a conflict between the Carian queen and the Greek men of Rhodes who became, quote, indignant that a woman would rule over them and subsequently launched a naval attack against her and invading Halicarnassus. Yet we're told that Artemisia learns of their betrayal and organizes a counterattack. Now, as the Rhodians attempted to penetrate the city, Artemisia sent people to protect their city walls. Meanwhile, the queen led a fleet waiting in an artificial outlet at the lesser harbor to overtake the emptied Rhodian fleet in the greater harbor. This shrewd military naval action left the Rhodians vulnerable and the triumphant Artemisia took their fleet, sailed it back to Rhodes. The Rhodians, when they saw their fleet coming over the horizon, they thought that they had been victorious, but this was not so. Vitruvius describes that Artemisia captured Rhodes, slaying its leaders and set up a trophy of her victory in the city of Rhodes, making two bronze statues, one of the city of Rhodes and the other in her own likeness. The latter set stigmata marks upon Rhodes, but afterwards, Rhodians who were restrained by a religious scruple that it is forbidden to remove dedicated trophies, constructed a building around the spot and erected a Greek outpost to prevent anyone from seeing the trophy and ordered it to be called an abaton. Now the Greek abatos um, translates roughly to unapproachable. The innermost shrines of temples were often referred to as abatons since they were potentially dangerous liminal spaces that were often inaccessible. The Rhodians enact an explicit form of ideological erasure by placing a Greek wall and outpost around Artemisia's victory trophy. Instead of destroying the bronze trophy because they are prevented by this law, the Rhodians covered it, redacting it from public space with the intention of erasing their defeat from collective memory. Indeed, a single public monument can simultaneously symbolize victory and loss depending on the subject position of the viewer. In this way, memory is a powerful tool that strengthens the bonds within and among members of a particular community. Moreover, Artemisia is said to have represented herself as a bronze militarized body, branding the Rhodian body with stigmata, which commonly marked enslaved people in this context, prompting questions about extraction and tyranny. And to be sure, I've wondered how to reconcile or if we even need to reconcile what I see as an attack against the personhood of Artemisia and a symbolic destruction of dynastic tyranny. And I'm happy to discuss this um, if you would like to. But here I'd like to consider or linger on how disappearing a monument in this way was an attempt to maintain existing power dynamics at Rhodes, wherein Greek men were politically dominant and politically visible. The story is powerful in its illustration of the ways that monuments and public art function. This example of iconoclasm forces us to think about how conflicting attitudes towards women, especially barbarian women, materialized between interconnected communities. Vitruvius clarifies that the Rhodian's behavior from the naval attack to concealing the trophy expressed indignance that emerged from gendered and what I'll argue racialized difference. 
See, in the same section of the Artemisia story, Vitruvius refers to the Carians as a barbarian group, a label that Greek and Roman authors used to label ethnic and racialized others. And though he doesn't directly reference Artemisia's Carian identity, he implies her racialized difference within the passage. Now, no traces of this trophy or sculptural installation exist, and scholars question the story's authenticity. Yet Vitruvius writes about these events as if they are historical. Indeed, in 351, the Athenian orator Demosthenes wonders aloud whether the Athenians should aid Rhodes, ruled by, Artemis, ruled by Artemisia, who was, quote, at once a barbarian and at the same time a woman. So why should a fourth century hecatomnid Carian queen appear within a first century Roman imperial text? Now, remember that Vitruvius dedicates his book to the new emperor, Caesar Augustus, in the 20s, just after the decades-long civil wars among Romans that culminated with the defeat of Mark Antony and the Egyptian queen Cleopatra VII at Actium in 31. Within this context, Vitruvius's description of Artemisia's public representation seems to align with broader first century hostilities towards foreign royal femininity, and specifically within the context of Cleopatra, this foreign queen who posed a cultural and political threat to Rome. Texts from the first century later characterized Cleopatra in ways that reflected intense hostilities. She's understood as this lascivious, immoral figure um, contrasting with respectable Roman matrons like Livia or Octavia. Cassius Dial tells us that the Roman Senate formally declared war against Cleopatra, a savvy political move that allowed Octavian and the Senate to avoid the responsibility for starting a war against another Roman, in this case, Antony, Cleopatra's lover and traitor. And thus drawing contrast between the Egyptianness and foreignness of Cleopatra and Roman masculinity embodied by the Senate, Octavian, and even Antony. In other words, the Senate mobilized Cleopatra's racialized difference through this formal process. It's also within this context, remember, that Virgil's Aeneid is written, which features Queen Dido of Carthage, originally from Tyre, who nearly leads Aeneas, an ancestor to, ancestor to Romulus and Remus, to ruin. The text famously casts Dido as Cleopatra, drawing a comparison between mythical and historical foreign queens. Although Vitruvius doesn't explicitly link Artemisia with Cleopatra, what he does do is tap into a discourse around foreign queenship that propped up intersecting racialized and gendered axes of the Roman imperial project. Perhaps his text was a warning in this way, a speculative narrative of what could have been if not for Augustus's victory over Cleopatra and Antony. Regardless, Vitruvius's description of Artemisia's trophy demonstrates how the visible erasure of foreign royal women literally mattered, as the redaction of her monument underscored that Artemisia and foreign women more broadly were not viable political bodies. In this way, Vitruvius offers a useful reminder of how monuments work on us, personhood, and the politics of identity entangle with physical statues, making these objects vibrant codices of social and political information. The corporeality of her victory trophy, in other words, is what prompted the Rhodians to cover and actively forget. See, if monuments are statements of power and presence in public, then absence is likewise a palpable monumental aesthetic that does significant political work. Now, to close, I wanna draw your attention to Pittsburgh-based artist and Monument Lab fellow, Ada Pinkston, whose work brings attention to the relationship between bodies and monuments, especially the absence of specific bodies and public spaces in Landmarked, a multi-part project that began in 2016. This project includes public workshops, performances, and a future vision to democratize the process of imagining and building public monuments and memorials. In her performances, the artist provocatively activates space that were once occupied by Confederate markers by inserting her own body, filling that space to call attention to the history's perspectives and experiences that are palpably absent. Pinkston writes, quote, now that these monuments are falling and the hegemony cannot survive, 
a question arises. What do we do with these empty spaces? Pinkston calls attention to the kind of political work of unsilencing that is required of us to address systemic failures that are made visibly present through the absence of women, especially women of color in the making of history. Thank you so much. My slide to thank you. Um, and now I would like to turn the Zoom uh, mic over to my colleague, Eric Varner. Thank you so much, Patricia. That was wonderful. And thank you also, Anne. I think, too, there should be quite a bit of overlap um, amongst the talks in terms of loud silences, present absences, and remembering to forget. So let me share my screen. So I, I thought I would like to start today just to consider what a monument is, or at least what ancient Romans thought a monument um, was. And this is a, an excerpt from um, Varro's work on the Latin language. And he says, um, so monuments, monumenta, which are on tombs and in fact along the roads in order that they can warn anyone coming along that the deceased themselves were once mortal, just as they are now mortal. From this, other things which are written or done for the sake of memory are said to be monuments. So this concept of memory and monuments is, is linguistically linked um, for the Romans. So um, what did the Romans do with their monuments if they became problematical or contested. And certainly erasure, which is something we've um, heard quite a bit about already um, this afternoon, was an apparently straightforward way to deal with the monumental landscape of Imperial Rome, especially as it related to the memories of those emperors whose memories were condemned. And what I show you here is a panel relief from a monument that was originally intended to honor the second century AD Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And it was a relief that it was a relief that came from a series of at least 12 reliefs um, honoring um, Marcus's military career and commemorating some historical events that had occurred during his principate. And what we see here is a visual commemoration and celebration of a triumph that was awarded to Marcus and celebrated in AD 176. And, um, but something has happened to this relief because we know from our historical sources, um, in fact, one that you've just heard from, from Patricia Cassius Dio, that in that triumphal procession, Marcus was accompanied by his son and heir Commodus in the triumphal chariot. So it was a double triumph with the emperor and his son. But you can see that Commodus is missing. He's been erased. So this is an example of the way that um, history or the Romans attempted to rewrite history their visual history through erasure. And you can see that it's led to some oddities in the relief in that the figure of the goddess Victory who flies behind um, Marcus and um, extends her hand with a victory crown over his head is extending her left hand also over the missing figure of Commodus. And then the temple has been somewhat recut in the background. So Commodus has been eradicated um, out of um, this relief and um, the historical moment has been redacted through erasure. Um, inscriptions are another um, point where we can see the efficacy of erasure and inscriptions often went with um, portrait monuments, portrait statues, commemorations. And here is a relief um, from the um, Roman theater at Cairo, modern Cervetri, just northwest of, um, of Rome, 
that um, contained a cycle of portrait statues celebrating the members of the first um, dynasty of Rome, the Julio-Claudians. And so this inscription went with a statue of Caligula's sister, Drusilla, who on her death was deified and became an official goddess of the Roman state. And you can see that in the original inscription, she's divine Drusilla, the sister of blank. And of course the blank is Caligula and his name Augustus or his title Augustus and his appellation Germanicus are allowed to remain because they also belonged to the first emperor Augustus and the revered father of Caligula Germanicus. Um, other sort of apparently um, straightforward erasures include the removal of Gaeta's name and images from the Arch of Septimius Severus in the Roman Forum, which was dedicated in AD 203. And you can see where Gaeta's name has been removed in the fourth line of the inscription. Gaeta was the younger son of Septimius Severus, and um, he was the younger brother of Caracalla. The two brothers succeeded their father jointly, but were unable to successfully share the Roman Empire and Gaeta was murdered at the end of AD 211 and Caracalla forced the army to uh, officially condemn the memory of his younger brother. And indeed it's one of the um, most virulent and violent um, condemnations of memory in Roman imperial history. And here we can see where um, Gaeta's name has been erased and replaced with um, a new inscription that gives additional honorific titles for Septimius and um, Caracalla and renders the inscription somewhat um, repetitive. Another contemporary Severan monument where Gaeta's name is erased is the Arch of the Argentarii just outside the Roman Forum. Um, and it too has an inscription in its attic which shows clear erasures. And in this particular monument, it's not just Gaeta who has been removed and obliterated, but also Gaeta's sister-in-law, the wife of his brother Caracalla, Plautilla, and Plautilla's father, Plautianus, who had also been the Praetorian prefect in this period in Rome. And the memories of all of these individuals are condemned for slightly different reasons, Plautianus, um, because he was accused of plotting against the imperial family in AD 205. And so his daughter is sort of collaterally condemned along with him. And then of course, um, Gaeta after his murder in 211. The images, the portrait images of these individuals have also been removed um, from the interior of the monument here, Plautianus and Plautilla have been removed from a panel which still shows Caracalla. And then in the panel which had Septimius and Ju his wife, Julia Domna, Gaeta has also been removed. So these have created these sort of eloquent absences that would have been quite legible, I think, to contemporary viewers, especially within the constructs of both communal and cultural memory. Because of course, if you were, if you were um, used to visiting this monument, you would be very clear on who has been removed. So you would be able to remember to forget Gaeta, Plautianus, and Plautilla. Um, Anne talked a little bit about how condemnation can also ironically preserve images. And that has certainly happened with the images of bad emperors who were, which were removed from public display and then often warehoused in sculptural depots. And this is just um, a slide which shows you a portrait head of Nero um, from the Palatine and a second portrait head of Nero from the Palatine, both which were originally displayed in the confines of the temple of Apollo Palatinus and then removed and stored in a cryptoporticus, um, which had been used as a place um, to put um, sculpture that was no longer on display. And similarly, a portrait of Commodus 
from the end of the second century AD that also was put into a cryptoporticus on the Esquiline um, from the Imperial Gardens, also a kind of sculptural depot for um, uh, sculpture that was no longer being displayed. Um, but erasure can maybe be not quite as straightforward as it seems. And Anne actually also showed us some examples of this. This is a, a base for a portrait statue of um, a young imperial heir named um, Marcus Opelius Antoninus Diodominianus. And um, you can see where some of his names have been chiseled out the removal has exactly followed the original letter forms. So you can absolutely read the erasure. Um, and again, kind of remember who it is you're supposed to forget. And presumably the portrait statue that topped this base was then replaced with a new um, image and just a detail of the erasures. Um, another kind of erasure is um, recarving when a marble portrait of a bad emperor might be recut to represent um, a new emperor. And often those kinds of erasures or redactions are quite legible, and I think deliberately so. So this is a portrait of Titus in the Uffizi in Florence um, that has been um, reconfigured from a um, pre-existing image of Nero. And there are clear traces of Nero's hairstyle at the back of the head. And I just show you the Palatine Nero here and the Uffizi Titus. So you can see that it creates a kind of hybrid image, a sort of Nero um, Titus that is very different from Titus's portraits that are carved ex novo from scratch. Um, or similarly, that can also um, happen in the realm of imperial gems. Here is a gem of Titus um, where we've got Nero's hair still entirely intact behind the wreath and on the nape of the neck, and then the facial features and the hair over the forehead recarved, resulting in a hybrid Nero Titus. Similarly, on a relief that originally honored Titus's younger brother, Domitian, so another official monument um, in a scene that shows the emperor about to donate military spoils, the figure of Domitian has been recut into his successor Nerva, but leaving the hair of Domitian entirely intact. And this would have been a very legible um, kind of recycling. Deliberate damage is another way that Romans could address problematic monuments. And this is a portrait of the third century Severan Empress, Julia Mamia, that has been entirely defaced with a kind of square, uh, square mallet, destroying the facial features, but leaving the rest of the portrait intact. And the person responsible for destroying this image has gone for the sensory organs, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, and even a little bit the ears to deprive this um, image of any metaphorical uh, power to see, breathe, speak, or hear. And you can see some details of this um, damage. And this damage was almost certainly carried out by an artist, by a sculptor because of the tools used. Um, the same thing is at play in images of Macrinus, um, a usurping emperor between Caracalla and um, Elagabalus between 215 and 217, destroyed in exactly the same way as the portrait of Julia Mamia, or his son, who was that emperor, Marcus Apelius Antoninus Diodomenianus. And you can see the erased inscription and compare the um, this destroyed portrait and damage is all concentrated to the facial features. The rest of the portrait, as you can see from this front and back view, is exceedingly well preserved. Um, coins, which were a major medium for um, emperors to communicate with um, their subjects, could also be attacked and defaced. And this is a Cistercius 
of, um, excuse me, a duopondius of um, Nero, whose um, portrait has been entirely slashed up and it's rather transgressive imagery on the reverse of a Kitharode playing Apollo with Neronian facial features has also been attacked. And this is an example, not of sort of state sanctioned um, violence or change against um, monuments, but I think this was actually a kind of spontaneous attack by a private um, individual. Um, in the immediate aftermath of um, Nero's uh, overthrow in AD 64. Or here, a kind of official response to coins with a countermark that has defaced the portrait of Nero. Or here, a countermark which was originally SPQR for Senate and People of Rome, which has literally kind of beheaded Nero. And that's what I wanted to end with was just the act of, um, of beheading statues and statues as effigies with real power. These are two more Neronian portraits, a gilded bronze now in a private collection that was cut from its original statue body and then likely buried, um, which is why it's so well um, preserved, or a portrait statue from Trollis in Turkey that's now in Istanbul in the archaeological museum that also has been intentionally decapitated. And I think these decapitated um, statues stood as, um, as uh, sort of anti-monuments or counter-monuments of Nero in their decapitated state for, um, for um, a period after Nero's overthrow. And I think um, I'll end there and just um, also sort of end with this idea of ancient monuments as potentially counter monuments or anti monuments in terms of current dialogues about um, monuments and memory. So I will end um, my screen share and turn it back over to Hallie for uh, further moderation. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. I'll uh, invite uh, Patricia and Anne to join us. Um, we have just about 15 minutes uh, for, for some discussion. Um, and I thought maybe we would, would start um, with uh, what you ended with. It provided a perfect segue into the um, the into a, a question that's been asked in the Q&A and that I'd like to, to maybe pitch to all of you. Um, which is, uh, you know, we are talking about monuments here, but we're also often talking about bodies, right, and representations of bodies. So how do beliefs about the body maybe inform the particular form of that defacement or damage? And what are the implications for the subject, right, who um, is, I think, in, I think in all of the instances that, that we've been talking about, right, a a subject who's already um, passed on into, into some uh, sort of post-life situation. Uh, um, so is symbolic uh, violence related to personal violence necessarily? And what does it mean for the subject when it is uh, erased or damaged? Um, so um, I, maybe uh, should I, should, does someone wanna jump in or should I ask some, or should I move through you? I'm happy to jump in for a moment, Great. <laughs> just quickly. Um, yeah. I think it's absolutely, at least in the Roman instances, um, related to concepts of bodies and also concepts of corpses. Um, because we know that the imperial images certainly functioned as the um, artistic embodiment of the emperor um, and that there were laws um, governing what could happen to imperial images. For instance, there's the famous um, anecdote about someone taking a ring with an image of Augustus into a brothel and being punished for maestas under Tiberius. This was not something you should do with the image of, of Augustus. And then I think um, the attack on the sensory organs in some of the Roman defacements relates to the defacement of corpses of um, 
criminal offenders. And it also relates to throwing corpses of these um, condemned criminals in the Tiber and um, portraits of bad emperors that were thrown in the Tiber. So I think there's a strong correlation that can be um, worked out on a lot of levels. Um, thank you. Anne, wait. Yeah, Do I was going to say, well, it's very clear in Egypt okay. because the, the body is, the survival of the body is one of the preconditions for having an afterlife, which is one of their main concerns. And um, that was what mummification was all about. Um, but statues were often seen as alternatives um, to that. So by defacing a statue, by defacing even an image, a two-dimensional image as well, um, that was supposed to um, cut into people's, um, people's uh, right to an afterlife. And in fact, this could happen before you died because people had tombs and monuments that they were making for themselves in the cemeteries before they died. And if you committed a crime bad enough, uh, they would take it away from you or they would, people would come and mess it up. And uh, um, we're not entirely sure because unlike you classical people, the ancient Egyptians didn't uh, write treatises about what they were doing and why, um, but we can certainly see it on the monuments themselves um, that there was, there were attacks on the, the memory of people and probably while they were still alive or shortly before they died. This is bad news for Hatshepsut who, who's, if her... Well, she was, <laughs> she was a king and the kings were gods. So her role was somewhat different. Um, but yeah, it did, it did cut into her, although that was the third left some images and some names intact. So there was um, you know, he may have felt like he was, I suspect the, the persecution of, of Hatshepsut and possibly all of these queens regnant uh, was, is simply that you've come to the end of a genetic line and you, that's when they tend to turn up women. And as a result, the people who succeed afterwards tend to persecute them as a, as purely politically. Um, the fact that, that that most of the third left those images. And there are also a lot of, of uh, persecutions of Hatshepsut that I've sort of thought in recent years might have been, they're just slightly marked. They'll, they'll mark out a name or they'll mark out a, a, a face or something with a, a slight mark. And that may have been for the artist to know that this was indeed Hatshepsut and you were supposed to erase mm -hmm. it. And I suspect when Amenhotep II came to the throne and ma managed to successfully get the throne, he stopped the persecution because it had done its duty, basically. It, 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 right. it had, had discouraged anybody else who might be of right. that line to want to become king. So interesting. Patricia, you have a somewhat different situation, I think. How does, can you speak to this? Yeah. Well, I mean, just some of the things that are coming to mind, especially with the case of Hatshepsut is for, well, at least for the Hellenistic period, um, how do publics imagine a body that has political power first and foremost, which is why I'm really interested in these questions of um, kind of identity, vectors of identity that may or may not be legible on the physical body. Um, with that said, another thing that's really interesting to me about the Hellenistic period in particular is that um, places and regions and cities sometimes, um, rivers, not rivers, but you know, places are, are uh, visualized as taking on these human forms, female bodies, right? Um, and so what does that allow? What kind of um, rhetorical and conceptual operations does that allow viewers to take on? Um, and something that I'm really obsessed with asking, which I will never have the answer to, is um, let's pretend that Artemisia actually set up this sculptural installation, right? Uh, was Rhodes, how was Rhodes gendered? <laughs> or did Rhodes take up a, a human form? Or was it, you know, some other kind of representation of the Rhodian um, body? And so um, I think for, for me, there's a lot more work that can be done, um, well, not for just me, but for the field more generally, <laughs> for my, my um, colleagues that study Greek and Hellenistic art and archeology, span um, I think we can think um, more about this sort of relationship between uh, personification um, or what personifications mm -hmm. offer, what are, what are personifications doing politically, um, especially when we're talking about difference and land and territory and so on. Thank you. 
Um, there is a, a question about whether, and this is, um, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying, I'm racking my own brain, but um, is, is there any material practice that was developed specifically to prevent these kinds of posthumous alterations? Um, I can think of one. Yeah. Um, in the, the late New Kingdom period, it becomes very fashionable for kings when they build their temples to cut the hieroglyphs like this deep. Um, I have pictures, I didn't, didn't put them in this, but I have pictures of um, hieroglyphs with birds nesting in them uh, because they make them deep. And I don't know whether this was the reason. It might have something that, you know, it makes them legible as time wears on. They're still legible because they're deep. Um, it may have protected the paint and decoration that's on the back of them because they're usually colored in the back. Um, but I, the standard story that, that guides tell tourists is see how deep they are. That's so that nobody could come along and erase their names. Good. So, yeah, so there's some, some precaution taking. You'd there. have to take down, you know, six inches of, of solid sandstone to, to obliterate them. Right. I will answer very briefly that question. There were, um, when you put up a victory trophy, tip, trophy typically in the fourth century, um, it means that you cannot take it down. It's a law. Right. Um, so the gods will be angry. They will punish you, which is why Vitruvius explains to us that um, the Rhodians instead built a wall. They couldn't destroy it um, or abolish it. So they built a wall, um, which is interesting because it does it, it operates differently in terms of erasure um, and this kind of discourse. It's a different kind of iconoclasm. Well, that, yeah, that leads into actually a, a, a couple of different questions that have been asked about the difference, right, um, between um, destroying a, a statue and, and setting it aside or putting it away. Both um, Eric and Patricia, you both sort of mentioned this. Um, do you have thoughts uh, about the extent yet hidden versus the destroyed? Yeah, I think it's uh, at least uh, on the Roman side, I think it um, illustrates quite clearly that this is actually not straightforward at all. And that there are very different responses that can be evoked by different monuments or different situations. And, and I think that these defaced monuments and the Julia Mamia is a great example of a powerful woman who was active largely as regent for her son, Severus Alexander, being um, destroyed, I think left on public view for a while as a kind of mark of, of denigration. And then that head was actually reused as a paving stone in one of the main streets of Ostia. So it had a second um, sort of denigration um, as well. And then removal is more like you know, trying to remove the person from history all together, but I think they can coexist um, for sure in the Roman period. But what's also interesting is that unlike today where we have a sort of um, generations between the time some of these contested monuments were erected, all of this is much more happening in the particular moment, um, which I think is, is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I used the word redaction, because when you redact, like, you know, they talk about FBI file, like notices that have been redacted and you can't read anything. And that, that redaction, that whiting out, um, I think uh, it's an addition to the monument or the memorial or whatever. Um, so I, I do think it's, it's different than just completely taking it away, taking a monument away or completely destroying it. I actually think it works operates quite similarly to some of the examples that Anne was showing us of the very carefully chiseled out body, right? To sort of imagine that being on display, um, redaction is sort of this monumental aesthetic. Um, so those are my thoughts about that. Um, and then it, it you know, I, I know that there are some activists and also non-activists who are just interested in the, the discourse and controversy around re removing monuments to sort of enslavers or Confederate officers and so on. And some of them say, no, leave them up, right? Leave them up. Um, 
um, not because we love these symbols, but because they have been kind of graffitied over and be, and leave them with the protest signs and leave them there so that, mm -hmm. so that we see the, the ways in which we are trying to subvert these historical power dynamics. And so I think that's a really, which is different than removing things, right? So anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia, I think you're right that redaction is such a great way of thinking about this. And it's a word that I've um, employ employed a lot because I do find it useful. Um, yeah, and I, there, there are also these, I mean, I, it's not quite the same, but right, the Hatshepsut um, sculptures are sort of put in, right, they're, when, they're, when they're trashed, oh, right, they're yes. collected, essentially. Um, and, and so they're not exactly preserved, but they're put in one spot all to all together, right? Yeah, I mean they're meant to be a they're meant to be sort of out of the way, and yet it has preserved them because although the one part that has not been preserved, interestingly, is that cobra. They seem to have knocked those off before they dumped them in the pit um, because it was a royal symbol. So, so that's one of the, the things. What I find the most amazing about the Hatshepsut stuff is they you continue to use that temple. There was a major festival that took place every year. And the, the, in the Greek period, there was even a, a healing shrine in the temple. It was extremely popular. And so they were going through and there were all of these gods who'd been erased and then put back. And so they looked sort of battered. And then Hatshepsut was just completely attacked all through. She was mm. she was gone. There was no king, which was, and so how did the temple function with all of these destroyed images where you would expect to have images? I mean, the king was so essential in later temples anyway that you know under the uh, Roman period they used to put in blank cartouches that said Pharaoh because they you know mm. couldn't manage to get it straight in Rome and they had no idea who was king. <laughs> But they but they put in an image for the king. But in in Daryl Bahri, the image of the king is is missing. Right, that's so interesting. Um, oh, there's the there's the cats making an appearance. Yes, I'm sorry, I can do nothing <laughs> about the cats. No doors. Lost. Um, so we just have a a, a minute left. Um, and I wonder if uh, I mentioned Eric your your concept of visual cannibalism at the very beginning. And we had a couple of questions of, if, about that. And I'm, I'm hoping that maybe you can just pop in and, hit me and point us to some of your work that talks about it. And that'll be our, our sort of our last moment, unfortunately. Well, uh, I think I was thinking about that in terms of the recarved images where one emperor literally takes over the image of the earlier emperor and cannibalizes the inherent power of the image and sort of I think that's also a kind of useful way of thinking about of thinking about monuments and is there a way of cannibalizing confederate monuments I'm I'm not sure <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, it's um, Patricia gave us one example, one possible maybe yes, example exactly. of, of working uh, of working with that. So we are uh, we are at six thirty, and I promised that I would uh, end on time. So I really want to thank our speakers for this wonderful panel: Anne Roth, Trisha Kim, Eric Varner. Um, I'd like to thank the Center for Ancient Studies, especially Matthew Santarocco and Mara and Mara Pollard. Uh, and thanks so much to all of you um, in the audience who made time to join us this evening. I'm sorry I did not get to uh, to nearly um, enough of your questions, um, but I hope everyone is well and uh, and that you enjoyed this time. Thank you so much, um, and good night. Good night.